thank you so much, uh, Kate, Tom, for, for bringing me to, to Nantucket. Uh, I'm a recent uh, retiree, and uh, I had nothing else to do, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but I'm thrilled to be here. I'm, I'm honored and I'm humbled. Uh, so many fantastic uh, innovators and, and movers and shakers in this, uh, in this audience, and I'm just humbled and, and, and proud to be a part of it. And I hope no one did an internet search for, uh, for my name to compare me to the other speakers, because uh, I did, and it wasn't pretty. All right, uh, if you type in Shane Battier in an internet search, uh, a few other words come up. And uh, I, you know, unfortunately, I looked on one, and it said, Shane Battier sucks. And <laughs> luckily, there were only uh, f four 49,000 entries. Uh, so I said, okay, that's not bad. Well, let's, let's try something else. Maybe this is an aberration. Uh, the next was Shane Battier overrated. And that was a little worse. So only about 169,000 uh, <laughs> mentions to that. I said, well, it can't get any worse. And it did. Uh, if you ever go on an internet search and say Shane Battier bum, well, you get 333,000 entries <laughs> about people. And I don't think they're talking about my, my, uh, my journey to end homelessness. All right. But uh, the one thing I do know and the reason why I'm here is uh, the one thing that has defined my entire career, the art of the intangible. Ooh, the art of the intangible. Or I like to say, a way to explain how a bum like Shane Battier stays in the NBA for 13 years and gets to wear one of these sh nice shiny rings. Thank you. Thank you. Playing with a guy like LeBron James, you know, it may help a little bit, but uh, <laughs> the, the art of the intangible, I think the French uh, have it best when, when they say it's that the je ne sais quoi. I don't know what. I don't know what. How is this person successful? I can't explain it, but whatever that guy is associated, whatever that lady is associated with, gets it done. I was lucky to play in uh, the age of uh, emerging sports analytics. When growing up, a guy like me was labeled a hustle guy, a gritty guy, a guy who will stick his nose anywhere, get it hit, keep playing, and he's a winner. Luckily, uh, throughout my NBA career, I, we're playing in an age now with this advanced statistics and advanced analysis. They can actually explain why someone is successful in a game of basketball, a game of baseball, a game of football with very precise measurements and statistics. And uh, thankfully, uh, because <laughs> I wouldn't be up here with, with, without these statistics. And the, the, the career-defining article that was written about my life, uh, I was able to uh, meet uh, a guy who I should probably pay a, a good dividend to for every speech that I give, uh, the, the world-famous Michael Lewis, who said, hey, Shane, I think you're interesting. I want to do an article on you. No one thinks you're any good, but I think I can explain why you're good. So I said, okay, great, Michael Lewis. Who, who saw The Blind Side? Who read The Blind Side? Who cried? Okay, good movie. I cried. And so the first question was, this is back in 2009, who's going to play me in the movie, Michael, if I'm going to do this? <laughs> Thinking a young Denzel, you know, but let's get through the article first. Uh, well, basically, this article summed up my career and explained why a player like me, who has very, very modest stats, and for the average fan, uh, I don't really do it for them. Uh, how can this guy be part of winning teams and winning championship teams? And at the time, there, there was a stat that started to get in vogue in basketball called plus minus. And this measures the amount of points, pretty simple stat, it measures the amount of points that your team scores when you're on the floor versus when you're off the floor. And for a guy who averaged 10 points and five rebounds, which is fair at best, I had an all-star level plus minus that was akin to the likes of a Carmelo Anthony or a Vince Carter, two perennial all-stars at the time. And everyone's thinking, how can this guy do it? Well, I believe it's because of my focus on the intangibles or the jobs that no one else wanted to, to do. See, in basketball, basketball is a very interesting game. Uh, there, there's a tension, a constant tension in the game of basketball between what wins games and what's best for the team and what is best for the players. Now, 
Compare that to baseball. In baseball, whether you're trying to strike out a, a batter or hit a home run, everything that is in the best interest of the player is in the best interest of the team. And so it's really an individual sport masqueraded as a team sport. And on basketball, it's completely different. It's completely different. If I really wanted to maximize my personal interest in the game, I would shoot the ball every single time I touched the ball. You know why? Because guys who score more points actually get paid a lot more, <laughs> uh, which I never was. Uh, but instead, I chose to focus on the things that directly contributed to winning. The glory plays. The glory plays. Now, for those who don't know me, uh, there's probably a good reason for that. I was never on SportsCenter because the things that I did uh, were never highly acclaimed. Uh, I, the things that I focused on, things like diving for loose balls and running back on defense. Yay, exciting. <laughs> Uh, for instance, boxing out. Uh, we're my basketball player. A lot of basketball players in here. All right, I'm sure everyone had a coach growing up said, you got to box out. You got to put your butt on a man or a lady and get him out of the paint. Well, boxing out is sort of a lost art uh, in today's NBA. Well, first of all, it's tiring and taxing. And uh, a lot of players think they're too good for boxing out. But what I did, you have to understand, uh, late in my career, I was asked to make a, a, uh, a positional change. And I was a power forward. Yes, yes, a power forward. I weighed 215 pounds, six foot eight. <laughs> Every single night, I went up against players that outweighed me by 30, 40, sometimes 50 pounds. I get switched off in a center. I'm pushing against Dwight Howard like, ah. And so whenever a shot went up, I knew that I can't jump very high. There was little chance that I would grab the rebound. And so what I did, instead of worrying about the rebound, I turned to my man, I put my butt right in his knee and got him out and prevented him from getting the basket or the basket and getting an offensive rebound. Now, if I was selfish and I was really concerned about my interests, obviously my higher rebounding averages, the more money I get paid. And so for the fact that I sacrificed my own rebounding numbers uh, for the sake of the team did a funny thing. Whenever I was on the court, there was a thing called team rebounding percentage. It's the total percent of, of rebounds that your team gathers when you're on the floor. When little old me, all 6'8", 215 pounds of me was on the floor, who averaged three rebounds a game, which was by far the worst rebounding number for a power forward in the NBA, our team's rebounding percentage actually went up the amount of rebounds that our team gathered actually went up compared to when I, when I was off the floor. Now, riddle, riddle me that. And, uh, and there are multiple, multiple plays. Another, another play that I, I tried, to, uh, I tried to, to, to do often was uh, taking a charge. Now, taking a charge is really the most unathletic play. You'll never see it on SportsCenter. Basically, it entails a guy running you over. And when he does, <laughs> your team gets the ball. And uh, I was known throughout my career, my career due for taking charges. Now, if I was really concerned about my personal interests, guess what? I wouldn't take a lot of charges because they hurt. And my wife can attest, uh, I struggled some days getting out of bed because of my love for the charge, <laughs> all for one single possession. But I knew if I did that, it would add to our team's chances of winning just by this much. And that's why. Uh, it's, it's interesting to come here and talk about the intersection of, of art and commerce. Now, in the NBA, in basketball, uh, there's a lot of obvious art leading to commerce. Uh, the aforementioned LeBron James. Uh, his art is pretty evident. I think everyone would agree that he is an, an artiste. And the commerce is also actually pretty evident. When LeBron James dunks, kids go out and buy his jersey. Right? When Kevin Durant has a magical game and scores 60 points, people tune in. Advertisers like when people tune in. And the NBA is able to ask a little more for their advertising rights fees. Um, if you brought in the NBA commissioner and uh, Adam Silver, who's also a Duke grad, 
uh, and asked him, you know, how does Shane Battier's game translate to uh, the commerce of the NBA? And I think he would uh, take a, a long while to figure out a few reasons why my art would lead to the commerce. And so uh, when thinking about this, this presentation, <laughs> I had to think of it in a different way. Uh, my commerce, and the only commerce that I cared about, was the success of the team, the success of every project that I was part of. And it's not just in basketball, but in life. And my art is what am I doing to make my team this much better, this much better. Now, it's really easy for everyone to say, oh, I want to make my, my team better. I, I, want to, I want the spotlight on me. When you have the laser pointer in your hand in the presentation, when you have the deus at the board meeting, a much more difficult task, and this is where the, the art of the intangible comes in, is can you impact your project? Can you impact your team when you don't have the laser pointer in your hand, when you're not at the deus, when no one thinks that you're even part of the journey that you're on. And that was exactly uh, my challenge. And it was a fun challenge for me, more so than, than having the ball in my hand. Now, now listen, if you master the intangible and you become a person that other people say, wow, that, that person has mastered the intangible, a lot of people take it. As a, as a slap in the face, like you're not good enough to have the ball in your hand and, and take the last shot. And uh, I say it's, it's baloney because the people that are on the journey with you and understand how important the little things are uh, will value you and you'll always have a job. And that was my main focus, my main goal as a basketball player, as a guy who was always counted out, as a guy who was told that I was never good enough. My main goal was simple, to make my coach sweat at night, sweat every time he sat me on the bench. And so many people, you know, this is true for business, sports, complain about, oh, the coach wouldn't put me in. All I need is, all I need is a chance. I need a chance, an opportunity. Well, what I tell, I just, I tell this to kids, it's the most important lesson I tell kids, Make your coach put you in. Make your coach. What are you doing to contribute to the success of the team? And what intangible things, what little things. Every year, I used to be the team bookie. Yes, the team bookie. NBA seasons were long, all right, and you need, you need things to do. And so every year, I would run the NFL knockout pool. Who's, who's done one of those? All right, those are fun. We're the knockout pools where you have to pick a team to win every week, and if that team loses, guess what, you're out. And the last man standing wins the pot. And in March, I used to run the NCAA tournament uh, pool. All right? Now, again, it was probably my best interest not to do this. You know what? Because there's other things I probably could be doing with better use of my time. Uh, but I knew that by having these contests and by bringing people together just a little bit, I'm contributing to the time where we need that communication and that solidarity and that bond uh, when things especially get hairy. You know, I'm not advocating it. You know, people here open up their own sports book on the side. Uh, this is not, you know, not gambling. We, 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 played for, uh, we played for marbles. We didn't play for real money, in case anyone uh, is listening. Uh, but uh, whatever you can do to, to, to add to the greater good, whether anyone will notice or not, uh, will, will make your team better. And uh, I have a, a famous sign that I uh, put above my, my son's bed. My son's six years old. He's going to be way better than I ever was. Well, he's a lefty. Lefties are, have a sweet stroke. <laughs> and the sign says, champions are made when no one is looking. Champions are made when no one is looking. And uh, I sort of laugh at that, uh, that sign because there is no better sign to sum up my career than that sign. I lived that 
literally, literally. You know why? My last few years in the NBA, I was first or last, depending on how you look at it, in a stat called time per possession. I averaged one second per possession. So basically, I was the NBA's version of hot potato. I would catch it, <laughs> throw it to LeBron. I would catch it, throw it to Dwayne Wade. I would catch it, throw it to Chris Bosh, all right? Yes, hot potato. Well, that did two things. Um, one, I was a, a, an amazing mover of the basketball. And you'll always hear a bas basketball coach say, you have to move the basketball, you have to move the basketball. So I was, as far as I was concerned, I was the best, the best ever. <laughs> uh, well, I broke it down into the minutes that I, that I played. And I, I found out that with this stat, 98% of the time I was on the court, I didn't touch the ball. <laughs> Think about that. Only 2% of the time that I was on the court, I actually physically touched the ball, all right? And I would spend hours and hours and hours working on my shooting and my passing and my ball handling, only get to a game where I'm only going to touch the ball 2% of the time, all right? I don't know about you, but most people watch the player with the ball or guarding the ball, all right? <laughs> so literally, when I say champions are made when no one's, when, when no one's watching, no one is watching me for 98% of the time. But yet, I was an integral part of my team. And I was an integral piece, and my coach sweat when I didn't play. Well, how did I do that? I, I always looked at ways to impact the game. The, the aforementioned boxing out. The aforementioned taking charges. Sexy plays like running back on defense. <laughs> All of these were made up my 98% of my time spent away from the ball. And in basketball, uh, especially when you play with great players, literally on offense, I would stand in the corner. I became one of the, the best th corner three-point shooters in the NBA. It was sort of my claim to fame. And if, it, if I was concerned about my personal interests, every time my teammate had the ball, I would have ran to him taking the ball and shot it. But I understood the importance of space. And any time you have a, a fantastic athlete like a Dwayne Wade or LeBron James, they're at their best when they have a lot of space to operate. And so basically, my coach said, Shane, get the hell out of the way, let LeBron do his thing. <laughs> and that's, that's actually important. Because the further that I was away from LeBron and the ball, my defender had to respect my shooting ability. And that drew my defender one step closer away from LeBron. And, uh, <laughs> and so sometimes being an a person that exhibits intangibles is, is almost counterintuitive, but essential for uh, the success and the vitality of the team. And that's what I would charge to all of you. Look at yourself. How are you? in an in a, in a, in a almost counterintuitive way, helping your family, helping your business, helping your nonprofits. What are you doing? What are you doing? Is this a habit of looking at a situation and not looking at the obvious? I'm not getting the ball. I'm not getting the shots. I'm not getting the playing time. What can I control? What can I control? What can I control? And this is a habit that I developed and allowed me to, to stay in the league and, and have tremendous success always be part of a championship team. I've, I've won multiple championships uh, by, by just focusing on the little things, the intangibles, the je ne sais quoi, that maybe no one else appreciated but me. And what this does, it develops a habit that you're always looking for that edge, that slight edge. And Amazing things happen when you are always trying to just gain a little bit of real estate for your team. A little more, a little more, a little more. It's, it's who you become. And then you are presented with the opportunity to have the ball in your hand. You are, you are presented the opportunity to be a difference maker. 
And you know what? Because it's your habit, you're ready to take the mantle. A career-defining two weeks for, for me was in 2013. I wear this ring, World Champions, Miami Heat, 2013. We were playing the Indiana Pacers in the Eastern Conference Finals. Much hated rival. And I was getting the snot beat out of me. I was guarding David West and Roy Hibbert. Roy Hibbert weighs about 300 pounds. David West, big guy, 6'8", 260 pounds. And they're bullies, and they're beating me up. <laughs> And I'm struggling. I'm fighting. But I can't hit a shot. I can't hit a shot. I'm going crazy. The biggest series of the year. And I can't help my team at all. And I'm so frustrated. Well, my coach was also frustrated. And so slowly but surely, my playing time decreased. Game five, played about 10 minutes. Game six, played about two minutes. So I'm not feeling too confident in, in who I am and my ability to help the team. So I go to Coach Spolstra. We play Indiana Game 7 in Miami. Biggest game of the year. Winner goes to the NBA Finals. We're the defending champ. It's our chance to repeat. And I say, Coach Spolstra, if you play me in Game 7, you're not going to regret it. I've been here. I've been a rock. I've been steady. In every big game, I've produced. And I promise you, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm telling you, I'm going to do something. And Coach Spolter said, hey, Shane, we know. We know. So I took that as awesome. So I went home, <laughs> told my wife, Heidi, tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. Battier is back tonight. <laughs> I prepared like a champion. I got my nap in. I ate, you know, ate some extra uh, so Wheaties before the game, I'm feeling great. Pre-game, I'm warming up, I'm feeling good. Tonight's the night, I'm back. Game starts. First quarter goes, nah, still got my warm up on. All right, he's saving me, saving me for a big moment. <laughs> Halftime rolls around. No bueno, I run into the locker room. We're winning by a pretty good margin. Still don't get in the game. Third quarter rolls around. We have a great quarter sitting on the bench, cheering for my team, always cheering for my team. Fourth quarter, we're up by 35 points. It's evident that we're going to win the game. <laughs> Guess who's the only player who didn't get in the game? Yours truly. Yours truly. I might not want to play in a 40-point blowout anyways, but still. <laughs> Point is, after I put my heart and soul on the line and said, I'm going to be there, I'm going to produce, because my, the purity I had for my teammates I was going to be there. I never had a more crushing blow in the game of basketball than to say, you know what, Shane? Our best chance of winning does not involve you for one second. And so that night, my wife and I went and drank beer and sang karaoke, and that's, that's how we, <laughs> some, uh, some of us cope. Um, it was li literally the lowest point of my NBA career. And the first time in 12 years, I had never been put in a game. I, I missed an entire game because of a coach's decision. So fast forward to the NBA Finals, Spurs. We're going for back-to-back. -back. Spurs are awesome, as, uh, as events this year when they kicked our butt. But 2013, here we are. Game one, I still don't play. Game two, puts me in for about five minutes. Game three, a little more. Game four, I start to hit some threes. I feel it. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Game five, a couple more. Nice plays. Game six, I make three out of four of threes. Game seven, here we are. Game seven of the NBA Finals, the time when every kid dreams about in his, in his driveway. Game seven at our house, American Airlines Arena, against the, against the San Antonio Spurs, winner take all, winner lives forever, loser, no one remembers. And I go out, and I knew because I had the habit of staying in the moment and doing whatever I could. And I didn't know what I was going to do that night. But given the chance, I was going to make a difference. And he, Coach Spolster puts me in first three minutes. Whoosh, three, splash. The ball, next play. Whoosh, three, splash. Splash, splash, splash. I make my first five three-pointers. I finished the game, 
six for eight from three-point land, scoring 18 points. Our team only had four players to score that night. And I don't think anybody, yours truly included, thought that I'd be one of those, pe one of those players. <laughs> I go on to make an NBA Game 7 Finals six three-pointers in the biggest game in my career. And when the buzzer sounded, all I could do was cry because I had known where I'd come from two weeks earlier singing bad karaoke and drinking beer with my wife. <laughs> And now I was at the pinnacle. But the only way that I could have got there was the purity of the heart and the selflessness and the attention to doing whatever it takes, whatever it takes, whether people recognize it or not, to seize the moment. And I was lucky that night uh, to seize it in a big way and live forever. And so when I, with, with that in my mind, I say, you know what, I'm going to search one more thing on the internet. And so I put in Shane Battier win, and I was happy to see half a million response. So, thank you very much.